Paul Shepard and Ed Mitchell continue to work on the surface of the moon. Now about uh, three hours into their uh, planned four-hour walk and running about a half hour behind and getting their experiments set up. They're finding the work a little harder than they had anticipated and the ground somewhat rougher than they had anticipated. Uh, but they are uh, at work. They both say that they're in good shape. Their heartbeats show to be high as if they had been exerting uh, considerable uh, effort in uh, getting these experiments set up. But uh, all is going well with the mission. These are the, uh, this is the scientific package uh, to be set up on the moon. The next walk tomorrow morning is a geologic traverse that's just a walk to pick up rocks and to study rocks and study formations uh, by eye. These are the scientific instruments that will measure uh, many things on the moon surface for a long time to come. And Dr. Noel Hinners, a uh, lunar scientist, is with Bruce Morton in Houston. I wonder if you gentlemen would like to discuss the experiments being set up now there on the moon. Well, really, I have a, kind of a citizen's question, I guess. Uh, Dr. Hinners, it seems to me that uh, Ever since lunar exploration started, there's been a great tendency to bang, thump, and fire things into the moon. Uh, mortars, thumpers, S-4B stages. What does all this bombardment of the moon uh, accomplish? It was the main thing that we're trying to detect here is structure in the subsurface of the moon. There are many independent lines of evidence indicating that there should be subsurface layering. Uh, we know that the highlands of the moon are topographically higher, really, than the lava surfaces. And we suspect and have good evidence that they're less dense. This indicates that we've got a situation similar in some respects to continents on Earth, where the lighter material is sort of floating in a heavier subsurface, and that we should be able to pick up this layering with seismic methods. We also know now that the lava flow found at Apollo 11 and 12, do not represent the entire lunar composition. They represent more of maybe a percent to three percent of the interior composition, and a funny sample of it at that. From this funny kind of melt we get inside, partial melting, we know that there's a different composition inside. If you take an Apollo sample and squeeze it at pressures equivalent to great depth in the moon, the sample becomes very dense and heavy. It becomes so heavy that we know the moon can't be made up entirely of that material because the whole moon then would be much heavier than we know it to be. So we know that there is structure and layering in there at some depth. We don't know what, what depth, and it's the seismic techniques that we're hoping will shed light on that. So there's a, a layer of one kind of material and a layer of another, and by, by making the whole moon or pieces of it reverberate this way, you can trace these different kinds of material? Right. The seismic techniques essentially give you a velocity of seismic waves through different rocks. The velocity corresponds to the density of the material at first order. The higher velocity, the denser the material. So we expect these compositional differences to be reflected in velocity differences, which the seismic techniques should pick up. Geology uh, used to be mostly a matter of uh, picking up and classifying rocks, but there are a lot of these new methods now, aren't there? Chemical methods, uh, methods that come out of physics. Right. There's been a fantastic revolution in earth sciences in the last two decades. Uh, it's been the application of chemistry and physics that's brought about some of the, let's say, revolutions. But we can't forget that it still takes the geology to put all these measurements, these detailed measurements, in a context. We've got to know where the sample comes from. And we're finding that out about the lunar samples. So many of them appear to be foreign to the sites we're going to. We landed in the Mari, where the lava flows occur, and yet we found samples of material that looks to be from the highlands. By knowing where these samples are picked up and the relationship to the craters, for instance, we can then sometimes extrapolate back in time and in the geography to find out where these samples may indeed have come from. Now, the people who say that we ought to make a lot of moon flights always say, well, you couldn't just land in two or three places on the Earth and really learn anything about its structure. Uh, this is the third place that we've landed on the moon. Are we going to, uh, are you going to have any answers at the end of this mission as to what the moon is made of or how it's layered or how it's put together? Each mission takes us a step further along the line towards solving 
the problems of origin and evolution. It's doubtful, I think, if we'll ever get to a final solution for the origin of the moon. But before the program started, we estimated that we could make good use of at least 15 varied lunar surface sites that we would need to get a good feel for and get samples from to put together the first order picture of lunar history and evolution. It's obvious uh, that the United States isn't going to make that many, uh, at least in this Apollo series. And obviously, it could be something later on. Uh, has there been any thought given to, uh, to talking with the Russians about uh, you send an unmanned one to this area of the moon and we'll send a manned one over here and try to make some sort of exchange on that basis? Uh, I really can't answer that question. As you know, NASA had representatives over in Russia not long ago, and I'm not familiar with the total discussion that went on. Would it be helpful? Would you learn more that way? Everyone counts. What do you, uh, what do you think is the, is the most, uh, how to put it, the best kind of new find that could come out of this one? Are you looking more uh -huh. towards this experiment package that we see uh, being set up now, or do you think uh, picking up rocks as they're going to concentrate on tomorrow is likely to tell us more? Uh, the combination. One can't predict ahead too well sometimes what these instruments will tell us. We were very surprised, some of us anyhow, from the Apollo 12 magnetometer. It appears to be uh, investigating the magnetic field of the moon, to be probing to great depths in the interior of the moon and giving us information on the electrical conductivity, which in turn we can translate into temperature profiles in the interior. And it was, oh, I'd say five years ago, nobody really even thought that that was a possibility. Uh, the rocks we expect to be different at FOMO. Uh, we're sitting here hoping and praying that they'll be different. We don't expect them to be like the lava flows from 11 and 12. As you're well aware, there was some mysterious material picked up at the Apollo 12 site. So one of my favorite space nicknames, the creep, isn't it? Creep, yeah, <laughs> right. The creep, the K stands for potassium, R-E-E -E for rare earth elements, and the P for phosphorus. There's a rock picked up and uh, existed in the fine soil material that's very rich in these elements. And it appears at first cut to answer some of the mysteries that were obvious on Apollo 11. Like, how can the soil be older, apparently, than the rocks from which it's formed? Well, there's a foreign component in that soil, something that's been blasted in, presumably from highlands and other sites, such as maybe Falmoro, that has contaminated the local lava flows. There is much reason to suspect that the material contaminating the Apollo 12 site, uh, or polluting it, <laughs> to use an in-word, came from Falmoro formation. Uh, the Falmoro formation exists fairly near the Apollo 12 site, but also should have existed in the crater Copernicus. So when the Copernican impact occurred, chances are great that it threw out some the Falmoro material also. And we know that one of the rays from Copernicus indeed does cross the Apollo 12 site. So there are many people betting that we'll find much of that strange, creepy material at Falmoro. I think maybe personally, just for fun, I'd like to see it come out something entirely different. But <laughs> for, Falmoro, I guess, is, uh, is sort of a compromised landing site. It isn't really the highlands, is it? It's not the highlands in terms of what the typical lunar geologist would think of. The, the highlands we tend to think of as being the very densely cratered areas in the south part of the Earth-facing hemisphere and most of the, the backside. The FOMO is a, a funny one in that sense. It was blasted out of whatever the lunar crust was at the time of that great impact that created the Imbrian Basin. There was something which at that time we might have called highlands. It probably came from depths of up to 50 kilometers from beneath the surface. So in that sense, it's a representative highland sample. But it does not record the oldest history that we see in the southern highlands. Well, maybe we'll get to that on a later mission. Meanwhile, uh, hopefully some surprises on this one, Walter. Talking about the moon being punched and thumped and <clears throat> explosives uh, fired against it, as you were, uh, Bruce. Uh, you know, the uh, impact of the S-4B, uh, third stage of the uh, Saturn booster, uh, when it impacted uh, 
and was heard through the Apollo 12 uh, size thermometer. Um, uh, they put a warbler effect on it, so it came back uh, to Earth as a woo-wee, woo-wee, woo-wee. And some of those who heard it uh, in Houston felt that the poor old moon was complaining a little bit about uh, all of this uh, probing that was going on from Earth. Uh, the man in the moon uh, may be getting uh, just a little bit annoyed. However, man is learning something about where that man up there came from uh, through all of these experiments. And now we learn that uh, the, this first walk on Apollo 14 is going to be extended uh, for the 30 minutes uh, that is permitted. They have not uh, overused uh, the consumables, uh, the cooling water and the oxygen and the battery power they have uh, for their communications. Uh, so they're going to stay an extra 30 minutes uh, this time, but they're running more than that behind on their experiments. And just a moment ago, uh, we heard that they're having trouble now uh, keeping uh, one of the experiments, that uh, superthermal ion detector experiment called SIDE, upright. It keeps tilting over. Uh, it's too light to stay, they say, in this particular spot, and uh, that's delaying them even further. Uh, the ground told them to get that one working at least. Uh, that's the first order of priority, and then to move on to the other experiments. Uh, so obviously they're beginning to worry about their uh, timeline on this uh, first uh, walk. It's uh, now due to end uh, when the cabin is uh, repressurized at 2.27 uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, this afternoon. That's about an hour and a half from now. They'll actually re-enter the uh, spacecraft sometime before that. Mitchell will re-enter at 2.18, Shepard at 2.23 p.m. CBS News color coverage of the walk on the moon will continue in a moment. At Western Electric's Allentown, CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 14 will continue after this message. Tang brings you the morning as few men have seen it. The sight of our own planet coming up over a strange horizon in space. Earthrise. Now two more men will see it. And with them, Tang, the orange-flavored instant breakfast drink with more vitamin C than orange juice. Nutritious Tang for spacemen and Earth families. So we continue to watch uh, these points of uh, the bright sun's reflection, which are indicative of the experiments uh, being deployed on the moon and the two astronauts there. Going below the uh, upper double rig. Understand? Roger, right, understand. Put one hand. And two hands all the way again. Roger, right, Ed. And one more. These men are working too hard to uh, be there. Uh, uh, Houston, I got it uh, all the way to the upper double rig. One hand. Jocular about uh, their work and not quite like and, Pete Conrad uh, and Alan Dean on Apollo 12. Okay, the GFR deployment? Maybe when they get to tomorrow's uh, long right. walk, uh, they will be a little more ecstatic about uh, their labors. Thank you for that badge of minimum cooling. Roger, Ed. It's a matter of mostly just of examining rocks and their surroundings and gathering rocks. Uh, nothing as complicated as setting up these Kitty experiments. Hawk overhead is scheduled for a plane change at 118 hours, 9 minutes, uh, 35 seconds ground elapsed time. The plane change is to keep it on a uh, course uh, uh, roughly over the landing site and uh, in a position where it could make an immediate rendezvous should Antares have to leave the moon uh, uh, earlier than planned. This would come about only if there were some emergency in the supply of uh, life providing consumables, air, water, battery power. Uh, Terry's is scheduled to leave the moon uh, just
just about 24 hours from now, uh, tomorrow afternoon, after the second of these moonwalks. This one, uh, the astronauts, uh, Shepard and Mitchell, Alex, have, Alex is Houston. How are you doing? Run into a lot of problems uh, in just getting the job done.